This video is gonna be on heart failure and shock. We'll start with heart failure first. Heart failure is when your heart fails. Yeah, your heart can only take so much before it just no longer works. It can no longer pump out the blood that it should. What causes heart failure? Literally everything that we've talked about before. So any sort of, sort of cardiac pathology, all right? And that can cause heart failure. Heart failure. Heart failure. And there are many ways you can break down heart failure. Classically, we broke it down into left and right heart failure. So we draw out our little diagram, right atria, right ventricle, our lungs, left atria, left ventricles, pumps that out to our body, and we turn that to our right heart. And that cycle repeats itself, okay? And we'll just look at the right heart first. If your right heart goes out, you can no longer pump that blood. Your right heart will get full of blood and that blood will start to back up and back up. And where does it back up to? Backs up to your body, backs up to your peripheries. In right heart failure, don't you get edema in your legs? You get pitting edema where you can literally press down and it leaves a mark. So right heart failure, pitting edema. Don't you see jugular venous distension? from all that fluid buildup, so JVD. Don't you see fluid building up into your liver? Expanding it, hepatomegaly, it can hemorrhage, we call that nutmeg liver. Nutmeg liver. Don't you see all that? Absolutely. So that's your right heart. How about your left heart? If your left heart goes out, we call that left heart failure. And you can't pump fluid out, so fluid will fill it up. And that fluid will eventually back up. Eventually back up. Where does it back up to? backs up into your lungs. In left heart failure, don't you see orthopnea? Shortness of breath when you're lying down. If you have all this fluid in your lungs and you're standing up, fluid will pull up to the base of your lungs. But if you lie down, that fluid will bass your entire lungs. You can't breathe, you get orthopnea. They have to sleep with pillows. They have to sleep upright. Don't you see paroxysmal, nocturnal, Dyspnea, paroxysmal means a sudden attack of nighttime shortness of breath. They literally wake up gasping for air from all that fluid in their lungs. Don't you see pulmonary edema? Something you should know, macrophages will go in, actually eat some of this blood, and you will see that as hemosiderin laden macrophages. Laden macrophages. You'll see macrophages with a lot of these brown hemosiderin in it. We call those heart failure cells because they're seen in left-sided heart failure. Heart failure cells. You see all that. Now, which is more common? Your left heart failure is more common because your left ventricle has to push and work really hard, right? Like I said, it has to push all the way, blood all the way to the tips of your fingers, to your tips of your toes. Your right only has to push to your lungs, not that difficult. So your left has to work really hard and sometimes it just can't work anymore. Left heart failure. So left heart failure is the most common. It's actually so common that most right heart failure comes from left heart failure, right? We said uh, you get enough blood backing up, back up to your lungs, right? And your right heart will try and pump against this blood and it can and so it itself will get strained. It itself will get worse until it fails. So a lot of right heart failure comes from left heart failure. You can have isolated right heart failure. If you have really bad lungs for whatever reason, let's say you have some sort of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. If you have really bad lungs, your right heart will try and pump, get worked, have to work that heart until it finally fails. You can have isolated right heart failure from pulmonary pathology. So all right, pulmonary pathology, equals isolated right heart failure. We call this core pulmonal. Literally, pulmonary pathology causes this pulmonary pole is in the word, core pulmonal. How do we treat heart failure? Well, your fluid overloaded, your fluid overloaded in your heart, your fluid overloaded all over your body, so you wanna get rid of that fluid. We do ACE, ARB, spironolactones, all these things that work on your kidneys and kind of 
reduce that fluid. We can give beta blockers, which kind of reduces heart rate, reduces contractility. And you're thinking, wait, 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 wait. We're fluid overloaded. We've got to get this fluid, pump this fluid out. Why would we give beta blockers to reduce this kind of pumping? Your heart is overworked at this state. If you can reduce that work, then it can work at a more optimal level. It's kind of like us, right? We can only work at an optimal level if there's a certain amount of work. But if that work keeps piling up, piling up, then we can't work optimally anymore. If you go to a new job and they give you like 100 reports you have to do by tomorrow, you're, you're gonna freak out, you're gonna stress out, you're not gonna work optimally. But if they reduce that to five reports, okay, I can do that. I can work optimally. Same thing with your heart. So you give beta blockers. These all have lowered mortality. All right. And you might be saying, wait, I've seen heart failure patients in the hospital before. They're so usually put on things like loop diuretics. Yeah, loop diuretics are fantastic ways of getting rid of all this excess fluid. You pee all that out, but all studies have shown that loop diuretics are great for symptoms, but they don't really change mortality. You still give them, right? Because you want to reduce those symptoms, but just know that they don't reduce mortality. That's more of a step two question, but I've been asked that before. So that's one way we can break down heart failure. Another way we can break down heart failure is whether or not it's a problem with uh, pushing blood out systole or relaxing, diastole. So we call that systolic dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction. And the way we can do this is by looking at the heart with an echocardiogram, echo, and seeing if we can push out blood like we normally do. All right, push out blood like we normally do. So your heart fills with blood and then you push a fraction of that out. You eject a fraction of that out. We call that ejection fraction. And that is basically what you pump out, your stroke volume, over, over how much you initially filled your heart with and diastolic volume. All right. And diastolic volume. That's your ejection fraction. All right, so if you can push more out, if you have more stroke volume, then you have increased ejection fraction. You have, if you can't push that blood out for whatever reason, you have decreased ejection fraction. All right. Another way to look at it, if you can't push blood out, then your blood stays in your heart. You have more blood in your heart. You have increased end diastolic volume. That means there's a decreased ejection fraction, right? On the other side, if you push more blood out, then you have very little volume left, very little volume left. That would mean you have an increased ejection fraction. You pushed all that blood out. That's just a mathematical way they like to ask it. So in systolic dysfunction, you can't push that blood out. You can't push that blood out. If you can't push that blood out, ejection fraction is decreased. If you can't push that blood out, your heart can't push that blood out, it will f keep it there, right? It will stay in your heart. You have increased end diastolic volume. Increased end diastolic volume. In diastole, it can push it out just fine. It just can't fill. It just can't fill. All right, so end diastolic volume can be low. If it's really early on, it can be normal. But the main thing you should know is that it can still contract. It can still pump. So ejection fraction is preserved. It is normal, which is, the normal is like over 55%. Right, so ejection fraction is normal. I'm gonna put some stars over here because it's very important that you know that. So you might say, well, ejection fraction is normal. Why is it a problem at all? Well, if you can't fill it, then you eject just less blood. Right? You're just ejecting less blood and you get heart failure. All right, that is heart failure. We're gonna kind of switch gears. We're gonna talk about shock. Shock is when your organs don't get the blood and oxygen that they need. And you go into shock. We talked about one, if your heart doesn't pump blood out, then how on earth are you gonna get that to your tissue? We call that cardiogenic shock. Call that cardiogenic shock. And there are other types. There's hypovolemic shock. If you lose a ton of blood, then you don't have enough blood to go to your tissue. Hypovolemic shock. There's another one that's obstructive. If there's like some sort of giant blockage, then you can't get that blood to your, the, your tissue. Obstructive shock. You can have sepsis, distributive shock, where blood is flowing it's flowing, but it's not flowing through your tissue. Yeah. 
you have inflammation, you have leaky capillaries, it's, leaky, it, it's leaking outside, it's not going to your tissue. Distributor shock. So there are many different types of shock, and in first aid, there's a whole big table which compares them and shows like which one have increased cardiac output, which one has this and that. And I'm just gonna go over that table with you now. Explain some of these weird first aid tables that they like to throw at you. So let's first list the different types of shock. We so said we had hypovolemic, we had cardiogenic, we had obstructive, where there's like some sort of blockage, and then we had distributive. Most common being sepsis, and then there's another one called neurogenic shock. I'll talk about that in a second. And I think the way they like to break it down is physical exam finds like skin temperature, and then they like to break it down by preload, so the amount of blood that's filling your heart, cardiac output, and afterload. Right. Instead of saying preload, I think they say pulmonary wedge pressure. That's putting a catheter in and looking at your pulmonary vein. That's the vein that drains blood into your left atria and your left ventricle. So if you can measure the amount of blood there, then you can basically measure the amount of blood in your left atria, measure the preload, all right? Let's look at hypovolemic shock. In hypovolemic shock, you're losing volume, you're losing blood. And because of that, you're not getting perfusion to your tissue. And your body will freak out and it'll start to vasoconstrict and send blood to your vital organs. Try and preserve your vital organs. And send blood from your peripheries to your vital organs. So when you touch your extremities, they're cold and clammy because they're sending blood to your vital organs. So your skin feels cold. What happens to the preload, the amount of blood in your heart? Well, if you're losing blood, it goes down, right? It's not going to your heart, it's squirting out from your arm or whatever wound, right? So preload goes down. Cardiac output, if you don't have enough blood in your heart, then you can't really pump a lot. Cardiac output goes down. Afterload, we said that you will have vasoconstriction to try and send more blood to your heart. So you have more resistance, you have constriction, you have increased afterload, okay? Cardiogenic shock is when your heart fails, right? You can't pump anymore. It's, it's worked so hard it can't work anymore, right? So it's cardiogenic shock, it can't pump. So that blood is stuck in your heart and not going to your tissue where it needs to go. So skin, it's gonna be cold because you're not getting blood to it. Preload, filling, how much fluid is in your heart, it's gonna be a way increase, way increase because it can't pump it out, it's just stuck in your heart. So preload increases. Cardiac output, can't pump it out, that's the name of the game. Cardiac output decreases. Afterload, your body will sense it's not getting perfused, vasoconstricts, which doesn't really help its cause, increased afterload. Obstructive is when you have some sort of blockage, when you have some sort of blockage, all right, and your tissue's not getting perfused. If your tissue's not getting perfused, skin's cold and clammy. If there's a blockage, then it can't go to it, fluid builds up behind it, increased preload. If fluid builds up, it backs up, you're not able to pump it out decreased cardiac output and afterload. If there's a block, that's like as vasoconstricted as you can get, so afterload goes up. Distributive, distributive shock is when you actually have blood, but it's not going to your tissue. Sepsis causes inflammation, leaky capillaries, so fluid will leave through those leaky capillaries and not to your tissue. It causes vasodilation, so you have a ton of blood flow which is not going to your tissue. That's septic distributive shock. Neurogenic shock is when there's some sort of CNS injury and you're not able to regulate your cardiovascular system like you should, yeah? You have a ton of vasodilation, venodilation, blood pools and doesn't go to your tissue, and your heart rate decreases. So even if blood came back, which is not, it wouldn't be able to pump the way it should, some sort of CNS injury. All right, blood's flowing here. It's just not going to the place it should. Skin, it's gonna be warm. Blood's flowing, it's not going to the tissue. Preload. I'm gonna skip that for now. Let's talk about cardiac output. If it's sepsis, if it's sepsis, in sepsis, in someone that has sepsis, they're usually tachycardic. They're usually tachycardic. It's a high output failure. You're beating that blood to your tissue really fast. It's just not going to your tissue. So cardiac output actually increases. In neurogenic, 
However, in neurogenic, like I said, your heart rate decreases. You're no longer able to control your cardiovascular system. Cardiac output decreases. Afterload, both of them cause massive vasodilation. Massive vasodilation. Blood's flowing, just not going through your tissue. Preload, it's flowing, it's not it's flowing, it's not going to your tissue, and sepsis is leaking out, and neurogenic is kind of pooling somewhere else. Not returning to the heart, decreased preload. That is shock. That is heart failure. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks.